Good afternoon, and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Tim Lynch. I'm the director of Cato's Project on Criminal Justice. And today we want to examine some distressing legal trends uh, that are at work in the criminal law area. Our guest speaker today, Sidney Powell, has just written a new book entitled License to Lie, Exposing Corruption in the Department of Justice. And the book recounts uh, several cases in which ambitious prosecutors used illegal and unethical tactics uh, to win their cases. Now, before we get to our panel of experts, uh, I want to take just a minute or two to lay something of a foundation for the discussion that's going to follow. But before I do that, let me ask those of you who came with cell phones, if you just take a moment now to quickly double check and make sure that they are turned off uh, as a courtesy to our speakers. Yeah, it includes our panelists yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. The first point that I think needs to be understood is that there has been incredible growth in the federal criminal system over the past 30 years. In 1980, there were about 1,500 uh, federal prosecutors. Today, there are close to 8,000. Second, there's also been an explosion in the number of federal crimes that are on the books. We know that there are about 4,000 federal statutes uh, uh, on the books right now. But when you take into account all of the federal regulations that are churned out by the regulatory agencies, we're talking about tens of thousands of more regulations that can be enforced through our criminal system. I thought there was a telling moment at the Supreme Court just a few years ago uh, a representative from the Department of Justice was up before the justices, and he was explaining the scope of just one of these federal statutes. And uh, as he was explaining the scope, he was interrupted by one of the justices. I think it was Justice Stephen Breyer. And, and, and Stephen Breyer said, just a second. I think there's about uh, 200 million Americans in the workplace. And according to your definition of the honest services a criminal statute, about 150 million Americans fall on the wrong side of that line. <laughs> and this was a point where the attorney from uh, the Solicitor General's office, he kind of hemmed and hawed. He didn't really deny the point. Now consider that for just a moment. Uh, in the eyes of the federal government, we have 150 million Americans that it, they consider to be criminals. And that's just one of these federal criminal statutes. As I said, there are thousands more. The spider web of regulations is now so vast that it's really hard for an ordinary citizen to go about their lives uh, without breaking some rule or regulation. Uh, and, and, you know, this is just not the same America that, that we grew up with. A lot of us in this room, I think, can remember an expression when we were growing up. It said something like, you know, let's not make a federal case out of it. But that expression is really losing its force given the growth of our federal criminal code. Now, we also have to worry about situations where people have actually not violated any one of these rules and regulations, but have nevertheless been targeted by, so let's say, an unethical federal prosecutor. The lives of these people are turned upside down. Uh, their businesses fail. Uh, their families are shattered. Uh, and their life savings ends up going to uh, attorneys and law firms that are trying to defend them. As a matter of fact, uh, their own attorneys often advise them to plead guilty even when they <coughs> have met with their client and are convinced that they are innocent. A lot, a lot of people say, how can that be? Why, why would that happen? These attorneys will argue that the alternative is even worse. Uh, it's too risky. Uh, we're talking about complete bankruptcy if you don't plead guilty early in the process because the case will drag on, more money going to the attorneys, and uh, even a, a longer jail sentence if the jury chooses to believe uh, the prosecutor rather than their version of events. So these are some of the problems uh, that our panelists will be addressing, along with some specific cases. Uh, our format is going to be straightforward. Our guest author is going to go first and speak on the thesis of her book. I will then introduce our guest commentators. And after their remarks, we will then open it up and take your questions for about 15 minutes before we adjourn for a luncheon upstairs. OK. Sidney Powell uh, served in the Department of Justice for 10 years uh, under US attorneys that were appointed by both political parties. 
During her career in the department, she taught courses on criminal trials and appeals to other prosecutors at the Attorney General's Advocacy Institute. She has been the lead counsel in more than 500 appeals in the federal courts. And for the past 20 years, she's been in private practice, representing clients ranging from federal judges to international corporations. She's been repeatedly rated by her peers as one of the best lawyers in America. So she is well qualified to discuss prosecutorial ethics. So would you please welcome the author of License to Lie, Sidney Powell. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tim. And I want to thank the Cato Institute for hosting this event. It's very much appreciated. Thank Judge Kaczynski for joining us and also Ron Weich. This is a, a very auspicious occasion. I think I'm going to start with the foreword to the book. It is written by one of our panelists. Judge Kaczynski was kind enough to write that for me because the issues discussed in the book are fundamental to the fairness of our legal system. The main premise underlying the book is that prosecutors have an ethical and legal and constitutional obligation to disclose evidence that is favorable to the defense. There are legal reasons for it. The Supreme Court held in Brady versus Maryland that it's a constitutional obligation fundamental to due process. And then as a practical matter, prosecutors have all the cards. They are the, usually the, or their representatives, the agents, the police officers, whoever, are the first people on the scene if there is an immediate crime, or they're the ones that who have, who have conducted an investigation into allegations to begin with or put together all the pieces to charge a crime. They have control of the evidence. They have control of the forensics. They have control of the expert witnesses. And in the cases discussed in the book, they had even more control than that. One of my challenges today will be to uh, talk to you about the book without uh, spoiling any of it for you, because I do want you all to read it. It's written like a legal thriller. I wanted people to be able to read it who are not attorneys, and to find it, and for attorneys also to find it interesting and be held by it, so that you can continue reading all of it. But it is all true. It contains real transcript excerpts. One person recently asked me if I had embellished. He said he was giving me about 10% leeway to embellish for the sake of you know, making it interesting. And I said, I hate to tell you, I actually toned it down. It's not embellished. So with that in mind, um, there are a number of things from the book that I, I will share with you. Robert H. Jackson was one of our great Supreme Court justices, and as Attorney General, he gave a speech on April 1, 1940, that has been enshrined in legal history. He talked about the special role of a federal prosecutor and how important it is for that prosecutor to seek justice and not convictions. He explained that at its best, a prosecutor is one of the most beneficent forces in our society, but at his worst, he is one of the worst because he has such complete control over what can happen to an individual and so such broad discretion. A prosecutor can indict someone, he can have the case processed quietly and secretly, or he can expose it all to the public and uh, humiliate and, and degrade the person as much as possible through the process. He has control over where the person goes to prison uh, to a large extent. The government likes to say only the Bureau of Prisons decides that, but that's not accurate at all. The prosecutor has a lot of input in that regard, and particularly in the cases discussed in the book, that's true. But yet there's no overriding supervision of prosecutors. You'll see that throughout the book also. Their discretion is virtually unbounded. We like to think of the grand jury system as being one that protects citizens, but it doesn't. Grand juries are virtually a rubber stamp for prosecutors. There's hardly a prosecutor in the country who couldn't get an indictment against a potato out of a grand jury if that's what they wanted to do, or get a case no build if that's what they want. So the checks and balances need a serious revision. 
it's also important for federal judges to pay very close attention to trials. It used to be, I think, at least in my experience under 10 different United States attorneys in three districts across the country over a period of 10 years, it used to be that judges could trust the prosecutors to tell them what the law was and to get the facts straight. No U.S. attorney I ever worked with would have tolerated for two seconds the behavior that I saw that caused me to write the book. They all were adamant that we do it right, that we seek justice, that we be fair, and that we carefully exercise our discretion to prosecute only cases that we had all the evidence and were sure the person was guilty. We didn't have time to go or interest in going to look to find something to pin on someone. That was not our job. No U.S. attorney I ever worked with believed that was our job. And we didn't stack counts of indictments either. We would indict on one, two, three, maybe four offenses, assuming we had the evidence racked up to prove all of those beyond a reasonable doubt with no question in our minds that that was what should happen in the case. And we produced evidence favorable to the defense that the Supreme Court called Brady evidence. That was our job. I have stood in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and confessed error. When the trial lawyers got something wrong, I would tell the Fifth Circuit, we screwed that up. In fact, if you run through the Westlaw system, the word botched, B-O-T-C-H-E-D, you will find a quote in a footnote <laughs> of a decision by Irving Goldberg where he quotes me as explaining that the DEA agents botched it. I think that's the only time the word appears in Westlaw. <laughs> <laughs> and the quote was accurate. I haven't run that search in a while. Maybe I should do it again to see if anybody else has <laughs> used it, but it's in there. Lots of people wanna know why I wrote the book and why I wrote the book now. Uh, the answer to the first question is, I just could not stand what I had seen. It broke my heart. I have practiced before the Fifth Circuit for more than 30 years. I'm not going to say how many more. <laughs> my youthful countenance belies that alone, so I'm going to keep that secret. But <laughs> throughout my practice, I have bragged on and applauded and loved the Fifth Circuit. For it to have been given the repeated chances I gave it to correct the egregious errors in this case and not to get it right was just more than I could stand. And then when the bar associations for these respective lawyers also failed to do anything about it, I felt like I had to speak up. I know I'm not the only lawyer that has seen this kind of injustice. As Judge Kaczynski said in his dissent in the United States versus Olson, there is an epidemic of Brady violations abroad in the land. It is a significant problem. It affects the fundamental fairness of all our proceedings. And if the prosecutors can do what they did to the people discussed in this book who are, were Merrill Lynch executives, one was a United States senator, Others were other business executives, all of whom had led stellar lives to the best of everyone's knowledge, worked in their communities, contributed to charities, done everything right, and believed in the system. To have prosecutors literally make up crimes against them and then be able to push those through the system to conviction and imprisonment and have federal district judges in Houston, and then the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals not get it right was simply heartbreaking to me. So that is why I had to write the book. I knew it had to be done by somebody with some credibility. Defendants can tell you about all the injustices they've suffered, and everybody goes, oh, well, you know, he was a convicted felon. So I just felt like it was time that some lawyer stand up and speak out. When I did it, I had no idea what the reception would be. I didn't know whether anybody would pay the slightest bit of attention or not. It turns out people are paying attention. And so I thank each of you for being here to pay that attention to this issue because it is so important. And there but for the grace of God go any one of us. 
If they can do what they did to these people, as Brendan Sullivan has said, to United States Senator Ted Stevens, to four Merrill Lynch executives from Wall Street and Houston and Dallas, they can do it to anyone. The reason I wrote it now is because we have given the legal system every chance to work, and it failed to do so. And we also gave the bar associations every chance to do something about it vis-a-vis -vis the lawyers, and the bar associations did nothing. The Texas bar bounced the grievance we filed against the Texas lawyer like a Super Bowl. I mean, it practically came back by return mail, even though it was written by Bill Hodes, the co-author of the Law of Lawyering, and considered one of the top three legal ethics experts in the country. It was a 30-page grievance with numerous citations to all the ethical rules and citations to cases, and a definitive explanation of the facts that showed a grievable offense, and the Fifth Circuit opinion, which found that, yes, the prosecutor suppressed evidence favorable to the defense, but it didn't matter. So when the Texas bar bounced that, I actually thought about sending them my law license. I haven't done that because a number of friends urge me to continue practicing, which I'm not sure I can do, but I'm still working on that possibility. And then we also filed with the New York bar against Andrew Weissman and with the DC bar against Catherine Rumler. Uh, the DC bar just kind of swept it under the rug. The New York bar, Weissman at the time was general counsel deputy director of the FBI. So the Department of Justice was defending him against the ethical charges. <clears throat> they kept it for about 14 months, and then without giving us notice, the New York Bar punted it to the Office of Professional Responsibility within the Department of Justice. Yes, you heard that right. The Department of Justice was defending Andrew Weissman, and the New York Bar punted it to the Department of Justice to decide. Well, you can pretty much figure out how the Department of Justice decided that one. In less than a week, the Office of Professional Responsibility, ironically named, within the Department of Justice, now ironically named, dismissed the grievance. So I finally sat down. I said, OK, you've either got to put up or shut up. So I decided to write the book. Uh, that's a long explanation of why and when I wrote the book, but that is the fundamental story. The book tells the story of any number of high-profile prosecutions. It tells it as a human story because I also want everyone, including judges, to understand the human toll it takes when prosecutors violate their oath, the Constitution, and the rules of ethics. So there is a very human story that runs throughout the book of my client in particular, uh, some of Ted Stevens, and some of one of the prosecutors, maybe more of the prosecutors than just one. It tells the story of the Arthur Anderson debacle. Most everyone thought Arthur Anderson was horribly guilty. I have to confess that I also, as soon as I started hearing about the Enron disaster, I knew the ramifications on people across the country. Uh, millions of people lost a lot of money. Some people lost all their savings. It was horrible. It was an outrage. And most of us, at least from everything that was reported in the press, assumed that everybody that had anything to do with Enron was guilty. I was one of those. Until I dug into the record of the Arthur Anderson case, when Arthur Anderson asked me to consult uh, when their petition for rehearing was due, no, their petition, their reply brief was due in the Fifth Circuit. So they'd already filed their opening brief, but decided to consult additional counsel in the preparation of their reply brief. So that's when I got involved. I think we had 14 or 30 days to get the reply brief filed. The record was massive. Fortunately, Maureen Mahoney at Latham and Watkins was lead counsel because they had a mega staff to divide it up and dive into the mega record at the time. But it didn't take me long to look at it to wonder why the indictment charged what it charged. The actual offense against Anderson was alleged as witness tampering. 
which requires an element that I couldn't figure out how they were going to prove. And then when I read the jury instructions, they had altered, the prosecutors had persuaded the district court judge in Houston to alter the pattern jury instructions. Pattern instructions are approved for every circuit for many criminal offenses. If you use the pattern instruction, it's gonna be affirmed on appeal. It's already been covered. When judges deviate from the pattern instruction, I mean, that alone raises any number of red flags. There is rarely a reason to do that. But here they persuaded the court to do that. Between the indictment and the jury instructions, I just knew that there was no way Anderson should have been convicted. Turns out, as I dug into it more, the jury was out for 10 days before they returned a verdict of conviction. The company, Arthur Anderson, was destroyed immediately upon indictment. They represented 2,300 publicly traded companies. They had 85,000 employees worldwide. So 85,000 jobs were destroyed. The indictment had to be sealed for a week so the SEC could work behind the scenes to avoid upheaval in the markets. And then once the case went to the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit affirmed without a problem, affirmed the conviction. Finally, the Supreme Court took the case, actually took it pretty quickly by all standards, and reversed it nine to nothing because Anderson did not have fair warning that his conduct was criminal. Witness tampering was not the appropriate statute to use, and their conduct was not criminal at the time. And the jury instructions Justice Rehnquist wrote for the unanimous court, he said it was shocking how little culpability the instructions required. They had removed all elements of criminal intent from the jury instructions. The prosecutor primarily responsible for the Arthur Anderson indictment and conviction is now the head of the criminal division of our Department of Justice. Her name is Leslie Caldwell. The co-prosecutor in the Anderson case, Andrew Weissman, became general counsel deputy director of the FBI. He went on back from his days on the Enron task force after convicting Anderson. They then turned their sights to the Merrill Lynch executives on Wall Street. They wanted to send a message to Wall Street. They viewed New York bankers as wise guys on Wall Street, nothing better than mobsters in suits. Nicer suits, maybe, Brioni suits, whatever. But that was the basic attitude. It was to bring down Merrill Lynch or the Merrill Lynch executives. The destruction of Anderson gave them incredible power when they went to any other organization because Merrill, for example, knew that if Merrill did not cooperate fully with the prosecution, that Merrill would receive the death penalty that Arthur Anderson had just suffered. So Merrill entered into the most egregious non-prosecution agreement I have ever seen. They agreed that their employees would say nothing publicly that disagreed at all from the task force view of the facts of the case. They agreed that if the task force wanted to interview a single Merrill Lynch employee, a task force attorney could be present. The Department of Justice task force installed an overseer within Merrill Lynch who even reviewed the bills from the attorneys. So we had to be careful how we described what we were working on so as not to let the government know what that was. They named over 100 people as unindicted co-conspirators in the Enron litigation writ large, which meant that everyone had to lawyer up. Uh, if their lawyers were smart at all, they insisted that their clients plead the Fifth Amendment, because if you didn't and you talked and you said anything that disagreed with the government's view of the case, you were subject to indictment for perjury and obstruction of justice. They reminded any potential defense witness of that threat daily. Some witnesses got calls during Enron-related trials as many as three times a day reminding them that they faced indictment if they got on the witness stand and testified 
inconsistent with the government's view of the facts. So the Enron Task Force prosecutors, Leslie Caldwell, Andrew Weissman, Matthew Friedrich, Catherine Rumler, shut down any access by the Merrill Lynch defendants to any defense witness. In fact, our own Merrill House in-house counsel, Merrill Lynch in-house counsel, was threatened with indictment. After she testified in the grand jury, her status was changed from subject to target of the investigation. So even she, when she took the witness stand for the defense, which the lawyers didn't know she was gonna do until the last minute, was terrified. Mr. Weissman sat directly in front of her taking notes the entire time she testified. And they didn't give us any of the Brady material or evidence favorable to the defense that the Constitution required we be given. In fact, they told the court repeatedly there was no Brady material in this case. So the four Merrill Lynch executives were convicted by the Houston jury. No surprise, their lawyers were like deer in the headlights every time anything happened in the courtroom. The prosecution had witnesses who were cooperating with the prosecution under plea agreements that gave them extraordinary benefits. Their witnesses were the people who had actually stolen money within Enron. Yes, there were definitely some thieves within Enron. They all testified for the government against people who had not taken any money. In fact, as the district court judge sent the Merrill Lynch defendants to prison, he said, I realize you were just doing your jobs. The Merrill Lynch defendants did not take a penny from anyone. Merrill Lynch made $775,000 on the transaction. The Enron group made 53 million on the transaction. No one lost any money and there were no material misstatements to the market that would qualify as a securities fraud prosecution. So instead, they indicted the Merrill defendants under the honest services theory of fraud, which alleged that the Merrill Lynch defendants had conspired with Andrew Fastow, Enron's CFO, to defraud Enron of Fastow's honest services. Yes. Uh, that would be completely laughable were it not for the fact that four Merrill Lynch executives could not get that indictment dismissed. Did they take any money or property from anyone? No, that is a traditional fraud. In fact, fraud means basically stealing. It really falls under one of the Ten Commandments, but it's gotten more complicated than that. And uh, the indictment was something I'd never seen before. I did extensive research on it. I could not find a single case in the country from any state or federal court that served as precedent for making the conduct alleged in this case a criminal offense, much less a federal criminal offense. There wasn't one. No problem, send them on off to prison. Motions to dismiss the indictment for failure to state an offense denied request for bill of particulars to tell us more about what the crime is we're supposed to have committed, denied. When the Fifth Circuit got our request for bail pending appeal, the government argued that there was no substantial issue for appeal, never mind everything was wrong in the case from the indictment through the jury instructions also. In fact, I've never seen so many issues in a criminal case as existed in the Merrill Lynch Enron case. It was gonna be hard to condense that into something, you know, 50 to 100 pages for the Fifth Circuit to decide. Usually in a criminal case, you're lucky if there are one or two good issues that might warrant reversal. I, I mean, we had so many in this case, we couldn't, couldn't begin to brief them all. The Fifth Circuit denied bail pending appeal. The district judge had denied bail pending appeal. So the Merrill Lynch executives had to report to prison and voluntarily surrendered. The judge did allow them to go to the prison themselves, to drive themselves to the prison, as opposed to having them hauled from the courtroom in chains that day, which is what the government asked for, while it also asked for 24 years in prison for them. He gave them three to four years each and allowed them to voluntarily report. 
all bail pending appeal motions were denied, even bail, I, mean, I even sought rehearing because I couldn't believe the Fifth Circuit wasn't going to grant them bail pending appeal, but they denied rehearing also. Six years later, fast forward, the Ted Stevens case has come along. Judge Emmett Sullivan, very different from the judge we had in the Merrill Lynch Enron case, actually questioned the government when it said there was no Brady. He started requiring them to produce different parts of their investigatory materials and grand jury transcripts and FBI reports of witness statements. And each time they had to produce something, it showed, ah, uh, we should have been given that before. Uh, this is favorable to the defense. To the point that Emmett Sullivan w made it clear he was going to dismiss the indictment against Ted Stevens. At that point, we had a new attorney general. His name was Eric Holder, and he said he was going to clean up the Department of Justice. So he came in, uh, I think it was about six weeks after he was appointed, he came in and dismissed the indictment against Senator Stevens in the interest of justice. I thought, hallelujah, we're, we're going to make some real progress here. Now would be a good time for us to go talk to the Department of Justice and let them know what all has come to light in our case, because we'd finally gotten the notes of thousands of hours of interviews of Andrew Fastow. And he had said there was actually no crime in the Merrill Lynch case either. Even he had agreed that there was no guarantee from Enron that would have made the transaction illegal, the entire thing that the government's case was premised on. He said that didn't happen. They had proved their case only by using the hearsay testimony of Fastow's subordinates. And there was even one Fastow note that explained that he had said one thing to his subordinates and another thing to the folks at Merrill Lynch, just like our defendants had said. We only knew what he had told us in a five-minute phone conversation. So we thought that was rather significant development. He was the government's star witness against Lilling, Skilling and Lay, and uh, he was supposedly the guarantor that had made this transaction illegal from the get-go. We got nowhere with that either. Uh, we did come talk to the Department of Justice we were met with bristling hostility, and nobody uh, ever responded to our allegations on the merits. So we're back in the district court. The Fifth Circuit finally reversed the convictions after my client had spent a year in prison. They reversed 12 out of 14 counts of conviction against all the Merrill defendants. They acquitted young Bill Fuse, 32-year-old assistant, in Merrill Lynch, who had participated in the deal, acquitted him completely. He had served eight months in a maximum security transfer facility in Oklahoma, 600 miles from his young family. Our other defendants were not given light duty either. None of them were in prison camps, which I assure you most are not anything like you would think of a camp as being. Uh, they were at least in a higher level security than that. With each level of prison security, frankly, comes additional threats to your own personal safety because it's the least violent criminals that are in the lowest security facilities and the more violent as you go up the ladder. Uh, my client shared a cell with 13 people for the first part of his sentence. One of those people was set on fire in the middle of the night as he slept in his bunk. Uh, there are other prison stories that are not in the book that I, I won't use time on today, but uh, there was a lot, a lot that they had to deal with. Um, fortunately, my client came out fairly well. He is a very affable guy. There's a very poignant story in the book of some things that happened in his life before he went to prison that basically left him with an attitude of gratitude. So he went to prison with the idea of helping other people, teaching people to read, which he did, 
uh, teaching other inmates how to understand personal finances. He even had his wife send him materials to explain to them how to open a bank account when they got out, how to manage basic household needs and budgeting, things like that. He said that the prison system itself is a farce when it comes to any sort of rehabilitation or education for people. And there's another story, um, another heartwarming story from his prison that I will leave to your reading in the book also. After they were released from prison and after Judge Sullivan had dismissed the Stevens indictment, a third team of prosecutors finally produced to us evidence that accidentally they, well, they didn't really know, they gave me a disc. They didn't know what was on the disc. I mean, they knew that there were documents on the disc, obviously, but they didn't realize the significant significance of those documents. They gave me a disc that contained yellow highlighting by the original prosecutors of evidence that was favorable to the defense, that they had personally identified as favorable to the defense before the first trial. And they had omitted the key words and information from that when they gave us a very limited summary of what the actual participants in the transaction had said. One of the statements was just flat out false and misleading in the summary that Catherine Rumler, who became chief White House counsel and only left recently, had signed. She had said that a Mac Jeff McMahon, who was treasurer of Enron at the time, had also given a guarantee to the Merrill Lynch defendants and that he had said he did not recall in the little four-line summary that they gave us of his statements. Turns out there were multiple pages of his statements to multiple federal agents that consistently said McMahon said there was no guarantee and that McMahon also said he was participating in the Fastow phone call that was so crucial to the case and that Fastow did not give a guarantee either. So here we had evidence that both purported guarantors, the only alleged crime in the case, both alleged guarantors who despised each other agreed long ago before the case was even indicted that there was never a guarantee made to the Merrill Lynch executives in this case. So four Merrill Lynch executives spent a year in prison on an indictment that made up a crime while the prosecutors had yellow highlighted and hid the evidence from the firsthand participants that said there was no criminal activity in this case at all. And those prosecutors became chief White House counsel, general counsel, deputy director of the FBI, Matthew Friedrich became the acting attorney general for the criminal division under the prior administration who rushed to indict Senator Ted Stevens and unseated the longest serving Republican in the United States Senate, only to have that indictment dismissed after Stevens had lost his Senate seat for the same kind of withholding evidence that happened in the Merrill Lynch Enron case. What can we do about this? The good news is there are things that can be done, and I will run through them quickly. I try to remind everyone as I speak on radio, we even have to remind ourselves that there is a presumption of innocence. Everyone is entitled to a presumption of innocence. We all think that once somebody is indicted, of course they did it. A grand jury found probable cause to believe they did it. We just think that somebody indicted, they've got to be guilty. We've got to remind ourselves. I have to remind myself. Everyone is entitled to the presumption of innocence, and the government must be held to its burden of proof to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt by competent evidence, and they must be held accountable when they do not produce evidence favorable to the defense. So what can we do in that regard? Judges can enter what's called Brady compliance orders requiring the government to produce that evidence on a set schedule so that defendants have it in time to prepare for their defense, which is what the Supreme Court requires. Judges are now starting to do that more often. Judge Emmett Sullivan started doing that 
after the report of the investigation he required came out and it was identified that because he had not entered a specific order the prosecutors could not be prosecuted for contempt they could have been disbarred so the bar associations must be commanded to step up and deal with that um, i'm hoping that there is a public outcry in response to the book to urge bar associations to be more responsible and i know that there is going to be legislation introduced soon called the prosecutorial integrity act that should receive bipartisan support there was an effort upon the publication of the report on the Stevens investigation that Judge Sullivan had ordered, a bipartisan effort started by Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska to introduce the Fairness and Disclosure of Evidence Act. It received support across the board, the ACLU, the National Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Defense Lawyers, the American Bar Association, every state bar association I read about, Everyone, every major legal organization in the country supported the Fairness and Disclosure of Evidence Act. The only group that I know of that opposed it were the federal prosecutors and our now ironically named Department of Justice. Yes. So there's gonna be an effort to introduce the Prosecutorial Integrity Act, which carries many of the same requirements of production on the government and attaches penalties for their failure to produce that the Fairness and Disclosure of Evidence Act would require. So I'm going to urge everyone to support that legislation. And that means really, you know, getting more active about contacting your congressmen and senators and urging them to do something about it. And if judges will start entering Brady compliance orders and start reversing criminal convictions, which I guess is what it's going to take to get their attention, referring things to the bar associations with a letter just demanding action on it, and citizens start serving on juries with an idea of a single juror can stop an unjust criminal conviction. And you can tell if the judge is running a railroad in his courtroom or not. Some do run railroads. You'll see the, the juxtaposition of Judge Ewing Wurline in Houston with Judge Emmett Sullivan in the Stevens case in the book, and it is very distinct and unmistakable, the difference two judicial attitudes can make. And then we have judges like Judge Kaczynski, who is willing to reverse a criminal conviction and hold the government accountable for its conduct. It's all about our participation, fundamental fairness, and holding prosecutors accountable for their misconduct. It wouldn't take long to clean up the system if everyone did their part. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sydney. We're now gonna to turn to our guest commentators and our first commentator is also well qualified to address the subject of prosecutorial misconduct because over the course of his career, he has served in the executive branch, uh, the legislative branch, private practice, and, and now academia. He's presently the dean of the University of Baltimore School of Law. Before that, he was appointed by President Obama uh, to a high-ranking position within the Department of Justice. Uh, he served as the Assistant Attorney General under Eric Holder uh, for Legislative Affairs. Uh, in that role, he represented uh, the Justice Department uh, on all legislative and oversight matters before the Congress. Earlier in his career, he served as the chief counsel to Senator Harry Reid, and before that, he was chief counsel to Senator Ted Kennedy. He actually began his career uh, as an assistant district attorney in New York City, so he also brings prosecutorial uh, experience to our discussion. So please welcome Mr. Ron Weich. I'd like to uh, thank Tim for that introduction and thank the Cato Institute for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's, uh, these are very important issues that Sydney has raised in her book, uh, and I'm very pleased to be part of the discussion. These are issues that should be aired. Um, I want to start by commending Sydney Powell for writing this book. I said to her uh, when we were in the ante room uh, that there are lots of lawyers who see injustice in matters that they've handled, and uh, they 
deal with it by going out and having a drink. And what Sydney has done in writing this book uh, is, is taking her passion for justice and, and putting it out there for the world to see and to judge. Uh, and it requires great discipline to, to, to write a book like this. It's a, a very detailed book, 400 pages, and she deserves great credit for bringing her concerns to uh, a wider audience. Um, having said that, I want to say that uh, my reaction to the book is somewhat mixed. I think uh, that there are overall um, themes in the book that I agree with. And I'll speak about those. Uh, and I think, uh, as I say, Sydney deserves great credit for uh, highlighting those themes and, and, and publicizing the problems in the criminal justice system. At the same time, I find her uh, indictment, if you will, of the prosecutors in uh, the case that she handled, uh, the, the uh, prosecution of Mr. Brown, uh, to be ultimately unconvincing. And I'll explain why I, I reached that conclusion. Um, let me speak first about uh, the overall themes that I very much agree with. Sydney highlights uh, in the book and in her opening remarks here uh, the tremendous power of prosecutors, the uh, frighteningly uh, unilateral, uh, uh, almost unchecked authority of individual prosecutors uh, to uh, uh, ruin somebody's life. Um, Justice Jackson wrote about uh, the obligation of prosecutors to use that power uh, wisely and mindful of the fact that a prosecutor's obligation is not to convict, but to do justice. Uh, that kind of sentiment is expressed in various engravings all over the Department of Justice. But uh, sometimes those are mere words, uh, and there are abuses. Um, before we get to individual abuses, let me say that in general, uh, I think that uh, prosecutors, prosecutors I've seen in my career, both at the state level and the federal level, um, are generally honorable. Um, I think it's possible to uh, paint with too broad a brush in understanding this problem. To be sure, there are abuses, and they have been found, and they've been documented. But uh, in my experience, uh, many, many prosecutors are uh, honorable men and women who seek uh, to do justice in the public interest. Nobody's getting rich being a prosecutor. They're doing it because they believe that it's the right thing to do. And uh, it's, it's commendable work uh, for those who do it well. Um, that said, as I, you know, and I did say, uh, you know, the power of a prosecutor um, is scary, even if not abused. Just the judgments that individual prosecutors get to make. I graduated from law school as a very young man. I was about 24 years old. Um, and uh, I was in the Manhattan DA's office. And I had the ability, because New York State has a system of, uh, at the time, had a system of uh, uh, predicate felony laws, basically mandatory minimum sentencing laws. Um, that enabled me to decide whether someone was going to go to prison for uh, a period of time because I could refuse to allow a plea to a uh, lower grade offense. And I was disturbed by that. I had the power, and I didn't think I should have the power. And I had supervisors and colleagues who I could talk to and rely upon, but ultimately I felt I had too much power. And as I went on in the district attorney's office and gained more perspective on it, I was ultimately disturbed by it enough to, to, to leave the office and go into more of a policy role. Later in my career, I found myself at the Justice Department. Um, and again, I saw prosecutors who I felt uh, had too much power. And some of them um, were overzealous in exercising that power. Um, and what I think needs to happen, some of the reforms that Sidney mentioned are absolutely on target. Um, there need to be more checks, uh, internal checks and external checks on individual prosecutors' exercise of discretion, because nobody should have uh, unilateral power of uh, essentially life or death uh, in individuals. Um, a second theme that I very much agree with, Sydney highlights, the issue of uh, unduly lengthy sentences. And the cases that she talks about are white collar cases, uh, white collar criminal cases, but the problem extends throughout the criminal justice system. Drug cases, um, um, child pornography cases, uh, where there's been, you know, such a hysteria about, you know, that unfortunate conduct that, that uh, uh, people go to, to prison for decades uh, for um, uh, viewing certain material. Um, and in these white-collar cases, individuals who suffer the worst punishment in the world the day that they lose their job and, and, and are forced to uh, stand in front of a court and, uh, and, and face the consequences, those people are then sent to prison for years, even decades. And in the Enron prosecutions, as Sydney documented, there are people, Jeffrey Skilling uh, you know, received a 24-year sentence. 
When I was in the Justice Department, I would see the press releases um, in individual cases, any significant case, the Justice Department puts out a press release. And I came to realize that every single sentence that I saw was about three times too long. The 30-year sentences should have been 10-year sentences. The nine-year sentences should have been three-year sentences. The three-year sentences, and then people you know, who went to prison for a couple of years probably didn't need to be there at all. Um, so that's disturbing. And uh, joining the issue of prosecutorial power and sentencing is, of course, the issue of mandatory sentencing, which give prosecutors more power, more power over individuals that judges don't have the power to check. And so efforts to fight mandatory sentencing, and I'm very proud of my wife, Julie Stewart, who's here, who leads families against mandatory minimums. Um, and, and Julie is leading an effort that is really getting some traction now in Congress and the Sentencing Commission and at the Justice Department to deal with some of those abuses. And finally, a theme that I think is so important is prison conditions. Uh, it's uh, highlighted uh, in Sydney's book. Um, her client had a, a, you know, a, a fairly uh, tough time um, in the year that he was in prison. Um, and uh, other defendants, uh, uh, the prisoners face this. Um, and we think, you know, everyone says, oh, the federal prison camps, you know, club fed. It's, it's really not like that. I mean, any deprivation of liberty is serious, but the conditions and the medical care in any prison, including federal prisons, are deplorable, and that should be addressed. So having said all of those good things about the book, let me say why I find uh, Sydney's central points uh, somewhat unconvincing. She tells two stories, two cases kind of uh, parallel to each other. Um, one is the Ted Stevens prosecution, where there is no doubt, it is well document, documented, widely accepted, that there was prosecutorial abuse that led to a gross miscarriage of justice. The presiding judge in, the, in, in Senator Stevens' trial, Emmett Sullivan, found that. He ultimately appointed a lawyer named Hank Schulke to do a comprehensive independent review that documented every aspect of the misconduct. And as Sidney said, Attorney General Holder ultimately dismissed the prosecution dismissed the indictment on his own. Sidney, in the book, questions whether Attorney General Holder uh, did that only because he knew that Judge Sullivan was going to do it, so why not? Uh, I can tell you, I, I, I joined uh, the Justice Department in my role um, uh, several weeks after Attorney General Holder made that decision. Uh, I heard him talk about it, and I saw the effect in the department. It was very, very profound for the Attorney General of the United States to dismiss that prosecution, even if Judge Sullivan was going to do it on his own, for the department itself to take that step, sent an important message to prosecutors, and there was then a very rigorous, very serious effort to uh, reorient prosecutors about their obligations to disclose uh, exculpatory, so-called Brady material. Um, so that's one story, the Stevens case. The second story that Sidney tells is about uh, her client, Jim Brown, who was a Merrill Lynch executive involved in dealings with the Enron Corporation. Sidney alleges very serious, sweeping prosecutorial misconduct in that case, and I don't in any way question her, her, her sincerity, and she lays out her argument in great detail in the book. But unlike the Stevens case, where the adjudication found prosecutorial misconduct, in the Brown case, uh, the adjudication found exactly the opposite. That is, the federal district court judge presiding over the case rejected the argument. Uh, the Fifth Circuit, which I must say, uh, had, as Sidney points out, dismissed many of the counts of the indictment, uh, uh, but not all of them, nonetheless rejected the claims of prosecutorial misconduct. And that judgment was then appealed to the Fifth Circuit, where a panel of independent judges rejected it. Uh, the Supreme Court denied cert denied uh, a certiorari petition, declined to take the case, and then, as Sidney says, uh, three separate uh, state bar associations declined to find that these prosecutors had engaged in misconduct. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, we have um, serious allegations by one side in a dispute. As I read the book, I kept wanting to ask the other side, what's your side of the story? We didn't get a lot of that. Uh, but we know that there was an adjudication that rejected the allegations. Um, it's hard in these complex, these white collar cases, especially the Enron case, involved complex fi financial transactions, and then the procedural history of the case over many years becomes very complex. It's hard to, to judge it independently, but I know that we got only one side of the story. Um, there's um, another aspect of uh, the book that is of concern to me. Um, what, a style that Sidney uses is, is she recounts the litigation, she um, 
essentially provides transcripts of the argument, especially in the district court and, and to some extent in the Fifth Circuit, um, and, and tells you what both sides are saying. But she interrupts to kind of uh, uh, ridicule the arguments and indeed the individuals making the arguments on the other side. So, uh, you know, uh, she says Kathy Remler um, was seething and struck like a viper. Matt Friedrich was smug, could barely suppress his grin. Um, uh, a, a younger prosecutor named, named Stokes, she describes as really stupid beyond hope. Um, she uh, talks about a Justice Department supervisor. Was that Spencer? Okay, uh, Mr. Spencer. Um, she says uh, that a Justice Department supervisor named Rita Glavin um, uh, had an easy smirk and an affinity for androgynous attire, which I thought was really a, a low blow to, to, to comment on a, an adversary's clothing. Um, and and uh, she, she uh, ridicules the judge who presided, says Judge Werlein, uh, never, she never saw a judge work so hard in the face of contrary law to make sure the government would win. And at another point, she calls the judge clueless. As for the appellate court, she questions whether they might have been influenced by uh, the people who helped them become judges, become confirmed, or that they were intimidated by the high rank of the prosecutors whose conduct was being challenged. Um, beyond these kind of characterizations, she, of course, wages late, uh, uh, levels these very serious allegations that there was not just uh, you know, questionable judgment by the prosecutors, but deliberate suppression of evidence and suborning of perjury. Um, and and um, uh, you know, that's, that's a tough um, allegation to make uh, in the face of uh, adjudication to the contrary. Um, I know one of these prosecutors, Kathy Remler, was a colleague of mine at a law firm in the late 90s. We worked closely together. I was then a colleague of hers in the Justice Department, and I worked with her some when she became White House counsel. Um, she's an aggressive person. She's an ambitious person, as I am, as many of us are in Washington. Um, she is fundamentally an honorable person, and I don't believe that she's capable of the conduct that's been uh, alleged here. I don't know the other prosecutors as well, but again, I fall back on adjudication here. That's our system, um, that when these disputes are presented uh, impartial, Federal judges with the protection of lifetime tenure um, review them. Sydney finds the review inadequate or questions motives of people making that review. I, 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 uh, I, I still believe in our, in our system um, that uh, resolves these disputes in that way. So look, in the end, I come back to where I started, applauding Sydney for writing this book. I think it's a contribution uh, to the discussion. Um, I'm not persuaded by its central thesis. I reject specific allegations about, you know, uh, my, my uh, uh, former colleague, Kathy Remler, and others. Um, uh, I reject sort of you know, wholesale uh, allegations about corruption at the Justice Department, um, but um, I appreciate Sydney for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about these important issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ron. Our second commentator today has been the chief judge for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, since 2007. Uh, he is well known for many things. Uh, his uh, intellect, his very sharp writing style, uh, his magic tricks, um, his accent, uh, and his good sense of humor. Good but, looks. Yeah, and good looks. Good looks. I, I, I can't go through the whole list of the things he's done. But best of all, he's, he's known for his strong sense uh, of justice. And, and that comes through in his written opinions. Uh, his written opinions are so persuasive and well-constructed that they often reverberate beyond his jurisdiction in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, last December, he shook up the legal world in, in a case that Sidney mentioned called United States versus Olson. I'm just going to read a short snippet from uh, that case. This is Judge Kaczynski. He said, I wish I could say that the prosecutor's unprofessionalism here is the exception, that this prosecutor's propensity for shortcuts and indifference to his ethical and legal responsibilities is a rare blemish to the core of prosecutors around the country. But that would not be true. Brady violations have reached epidemic proportions in, in recent years. Now, just with that one paragraph, uh, the judge started a national conversation on the subject of prosecutorial misconduct because editorial pages, including the New York Times, quoted the judge and started talking about, do we have a problem in this country with uh, uh, prosecutorial ethics? 
Uh, he has spoken here at Cato many times, and we're glad to have him back. Would you please welcome Alex Kaczynski? Thank you, Tim. Always a pleasure to be here at Cato. Before I start on this subject and this book, I do want to tout another publication, uh, and that is a piece that uh, my um, uh, law clerk, uh, Misha Seiklin, and I wrote uh, for Cato. And I think, Tim, you were the editor of the book. Uh, it's called You Too Are Probably a Federal Criminal. <laughs> and uh, it picks up on uh, Tim's point, which is that, in fact, there are so many laws out there, and there are many of them are so ambiguous, that chances are very good in something you have done in your life, uh, if the federal prosecutors knew about it, they could, could uh, and they can find out a lot of things uh, nowadays using electronic uh, uh, data searches and so on. If they really want to focus on you, they can probably get you. And they could probably have you behind bars uh, in uh, very little time. So this is a danger. This is, a, this is the background to the point that Sydney is making. I think Sydney and Ron also acknowledges that point, the very strong power of prosecutors and uh, uh, for them to take this large body of law, this somewhat amorphous body of law, and go in for reasons that may be good or may not be good and focus on a particular individual. So that is a serious uh, danger. Now let me now talk a little bit about Brady and other kinds of prosecutorial misconduct. I think it's important because I think we, we have uh, both lawyers and non-lawyers in the audience to understand the significance of Brady. Uh, Brady is a decision by the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has come up with many decisions, Miranda, Brady, uh, 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 in, in, uh, in terms of um, procedural uh, protections for criminal defendants. Uh, and you know, people sort of think they're all equal. I would suggest that Brady is uniquely important, because Brady, uh, unlike Miranda, uh, where the defendant may confess and then he wants it suppressed, but you know, he probably did it because he confessed to it. Um, uh, we have, it's a procedural rule, but uh, Brady truly protects the innocent, truly protects people who have been charged with a crime, but where the government in its has in its possession evidence that if put before a jury would raise a reasonable doubt. And the reason the government has this evidence is because they have such an advantage in gathering the evidence. They know about the crime or they know about the investigation if it's a white collar crime long before the defendant knows that anything is going on. Uh, they have access to witnesses, they have access to electronic records, and once, uh, or if, the, if, it's a, if it's a violent crime, they have control of the crime scene, and by the time the defendant finds out about it, he, uh, uh, that there's uh, an investigation going on, the crime scene has been cleared, and whatever there was there to pick up is in the government's possession. So it's extremely important. It is, it is vital for the government, if it has evidence that's exculpatory, for it to give it up and make it a fair fight. Nobody is saying people should be allowed to go free who are guilty, but surely if the government knows of a piece of evidence that contradicts what their star witness says, it's only fair, it's only appropriate not to send somebody to prison without having the jury consider both sides. We believe in juries. We believe in 12 people uh, uh, acting together and thinking together, considering all the evidence, and then if they find somebody guilty, then beyond a reasonable doubt, then we can have confidence in it. But they are not given the evidence, they're not given the exculpatory evidence that's in the government's possession, they can't make, it undermines uh, their ability to make a fair decision. So this is incredibly important and terribly vital to, uh, to the operating of our, our criminal justice system. I would say so our faith in the system, the faith that Ron uh, has expressed, uh, that I share and I think Sydney shares, is based on the idea that we can actually have 12 people get all the facts, all the evidence, good and bad, and then make a fair decision. 
And then we have the burden beyond a reasonable doubt for the government, which is high, but not insurmountable. And we are then confident that those two million people that we now have in jail in our country, two million people have in jail, that they all belong there. Once the government withholds evidence, once the government willfully withholds evidence as exculpatory and gets a conviction, then we, we can no longer be confident. Now, here's the thing about Brady. How do you know that the government has exculpatory evidence? In most cases, there might be exculpatory evidence, and I agree with uh, Sidney, I give this to Ron. I think most prosecutors, especially most federal prosecutors, are upright, uh, and they do not, and this has been my, my experience, they do not want to get a conviction for somebody without a fair hearing and without a true finding of innocence. But there are always people out there who want to get ahead by cutting the corners. And of course, it makes it harder for the honest prosecutors because the ones who cut corners then get promoted, they get the kudos, and that creates us an incentive to cut corners too because after all, you, 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 know, you have your own career to think about. So it is exceedingly rare to find out that Brady evidence, exculpatory evidence, has been discovered. It's important to talk about these two cases that, that, uh, that um, uh, Ron has mentioned, and, uh, and Sydney to some extent, and look at what happened in those cases and what the reaction is when the evidence is found. Now, in the Ted Stevens case, nobody has said this, but this is not a case where the Justice Department came forward and said, whoops, we goofed, we had exculpatory evidence, we're going to present it. An FBI agent blew the whistle. We had a whistleblower, an incredibly rare event, where the FBI agent risked his own career by pointing the fingers at Justice Department uh, prosecutors and says they knowingly withheld evidence. And I hope you will read the book and find out. And I don't think Ron disagrees, but this was a huge miscarriage of justice. Senator Stevens should never have been indicted. He should never have been convicted. He should never have lost the election. There's just no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. If all the evidence had been available to the defense, that case would not have gone to trial. Just read the book. There's no dispute on this point. Now, the Justice Department, uh, when they found out about this, you would think they would run away and hide in shame, that they would say, oh my God, what did we do? And if the Attorney General at that point had decided to dismiss the indictment, I'd be really impressed. But the only, no, instead they stood up in court and said, no big deal. They said, no big deal. This was after, this was found out after Senator Stevens was convicted, and they wanted to hold on to the conviction. They didn't say, oh my God, this is a horrible thing that we've done. We are so sorry. They said, no, we want to hold on to the conviction. Different attorney general, it, right? It doesn't matter. Well, We're not accusing administrations. We're accusing the Justice, uh, the Justice Department. I don't care who the attorney general was. The point is the Justice Department lawyers, Justice Department said, we will hold on to the conviction. It was only after Judge Sullivan ordered an investigation and it came out that, in fact, this was huge misconduct that the Attorney General decided to dismiss. I'm not that impressed, I must tell you the truth, because at that point, it was unthinkable that, the, that the, uh, Judge Sullivan wouldn't have dismissed the indictment. There's no doubt about it. And I certainly commend the Attorney General for doing it earlier, but I would have been far more impressed if after the case was indicted, those who were responsible had been, had been disciplined. Didn't happen. Uh, nobody got fired over this. Uh, there were a few suspensions, but you know, the, the, given the enormity of what happened, uh, this was hardly a slap on the wrist. And now in the Brown case, I'm not gonna talk too much about it because what I want you to do is I want you to get the book and look at page four or four. Okay, this is the evidence that uh, was produced accidentally by the Justice Department, and it shows highlighting. Now, this was not highlighting that Sydney put there. This was highlighting that was there when the evidence was given to her. These are statements by witnesses that go contrary to the 
uh, evidence presented by the government. They knew about it. This was not an accident. Somebody went through and highlighted it. And what happened is it was not ever a finding that there was no misconduct. What happened uh, in that case is the court said, well, it wasn't a big a deal anyway. Uh, and what they did is uh, they simply refused to, uh, to, to, to reverse the convictions. It was not a case where they failed to find, where they said this was okay. It was okay to withhold. They just said it was not uh, prejudicial, which is what courts do all the time. It's what many of my colleagues do all the time. Let me tell you, just take one more minute to tell you about a case that I had about 10 years ago. It's called Ramirez Lopez. And what happened in that case is the government had 10 or 12 witnesses who had been brought into the United States um, uh, illegally. And some of those witnesses said um, Ramirez Lopez was a guide. And some of them said, no, it was somebody else. And the government, what they did is, before there was even a defense lawyer involved, they deported most of those witnesses before the defense lawyer could even talk about them. And the, the case came to us, and I was flabbergasted. How, how do you go deporting witnesses? If this were a corporation and they started deporting witnesses in a criminal investigation, <laughs> you would have them indicted. But the prosecutor said it's perfectly fine. Send back the witnesses before there was even a lawyer appointed for the defendant. So the case came up on appeal to us. Two of my colleagues, fine colleagues, whom I, uh, whom I dearly uh, um, you know, I, I respect, uh, affirmed the conviction. They said it's perfectly fine. It wouldn't have made any difference anyway. I heard the dissent that was so blistering. It was so painful, so excruciating that the government then filed a, uh, filed a petition for a hearing. Usually it is the losing party that files a petition for a hearing. In this case, it was the winning party that filed a petition for a hearing and asked us to dismiss, to reverse the conviction, to vacate our opinion, reverse the conviction, and send it back so they could dismiss the indictment. I will take my two minutes to tell you the <laughs> aftermath. <laughs> 10 years later, I get the same case out of the same district. Exactly the same thing happened. They deported the witnesses. So I'm standing there and I asked the lawyer for the government, what happened? Do you remember Ramirez Lopez? I think you yourself argued the case. They said, well, that case was vacated. It has no presidential value. <laughs> this is not a joke. This is not a joke. Their view was, if we didn't enter an order telling them they've got to do this, they had no sense of responsibility. They did it again. So we had to write an opinion saying, by God, you know what we said there when we vacated the opinion uh, at your request is uh, that you don't do this again. Uh, the fact of the matter is, lawyers who want to go bad will continue doing it unless judges do something about it. Now, fortunately, judges are doing something about it. Uh, there is a case out of the DC uh, Court of Appeals uh, called uh, Vaughn versus the United States that just came across, and they cite me, so this must be a good opinion. <laughs> uh, and they specifically direct the, the trial judge uh, to uh, enter orders uh, compelling the government to meet its Brady obligation. And then in Mississippi, a district judge by the name of Neil Biggers recently filed an opinion where he dismissed an indictment uh, because of Brady violation. It is rare. It is far too rare. These things don't come up often enough. We don't know of all the Brady violations. And if judges and prosecutors, including their supervisors, don't take really stern action when it does happen, it comes to light, I think uh, we, can, uh, we cannot have confidence in our judicial system. Thank you. OK, before we open it up and take your questions, I'm going to give Sidney Powell uh, just two or three minutes if you wanted to respond to anything that's been said, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, j just a few points. One of the biggest problems with Brady violations is a defense lawyer does not know what he does not know. There's simply no way to know it. 
because only the government does. So it makes it extremely difficult to uncover a Brady violation in the first place. As additional evidence that the government still didn't get the message with the dismissal of the Ted Stevens indictment by Judge Sullivan, I need only point you to the decisions of the Ninth Circuit in United States versus Cott and United States versus Coring, two cases arising out of the same prosecution using the same witness where the same prosecutors, for the most part, did not provide the same evidence to the defense that they hid also in the Stevens case. And there, the government refused to dismiss the indictments against Cott and Coring. They persuaded the district court judge in Alaska that it didn't matter in those cases because there was so much other evidence. It didn't matter that they had hid, hidden the evidence of the, that completely undercut the government's primary witness. And the uh, district judge agreed with them, like our district judge Ewing Werlein did in Houston. The Ninth Circuit reversed unlike the Fifth Circuit, and said, yes, it certainly did matter. And Judge Betty Fletcher wrote a blistering separate concurrence that said the government's unrepentant attitude is completely unacceptable, and she would have completely dismissed the indictment. The majority of the panel simply remanded it for a new trial. And I think, uh, I'm not sure what happened in both cases. I think they might have entered pleas to substantially lesser offenses. But um, no, I don't think the Justice Department learned anything from that. I can also tell you that the government is still trying to alter the ethical rules in all the states to include what's called a materiality requirement, whether the evidence matters or not to the defense in their initial determination and their ethical obligation as to whether they have to provide evidence or not in the first place. And if they're allowed to decide what matters to the defense, we are in very big trouble because to them, anything contrary to their view is said with a wink or a nod. They literally use that language both in Stevens and in the Merrill Lynch cases. If, it's, if the defendant said something that's completely exculpatory or somebody other witness did, oh, it was said with a wink and a nod or in the Stevens case to cover his ass, it wasn't really true. And anything inculpatory, of course, works to their benefit. So everything works to the government's benefit, thereby it's not material to the defense. So we've got to have ethical rules that require production of all evidence favorable to the defense. That's another reason why we need the Prosecutorial Integrity Act enacted to produce all evidence favorable to the defense. The Supreme Court has said that if the prosecutor has any question at all about whether he should produce it, it should be produced. If you even have to ask the question whether it should be produced, it should be produced. Just give it to them. That's the only way to ensure the trial is fair. In terms of the uh, credibility or uh, accuracy of the materials in my book, I'm uploading all the supporting documents to a website called licensedtolie.com and you will be able to look at the actual documents themselves. And if we could get a full investigation ever in the Brown case, like they did get in the Stevens case, which Judge Sullivan ordered, uh, just terrorizing the department with the fact that an independent investigator, a special prosecutor actually, was going to look into the Department of Justice, if we could have gotten the emails and gotten the rest of the exculpatory evidence, they still say it's not there, and I'm sure there's more, uh, you know, I would be impressed by that, but we can't get that. We couldn't get that. And you can look at the documents and read the books and uh, read the book and, and come to your own conclusion on that. I would stake my law license on the accuracy of everything in that book. And I wonder if Ms. Rumler would do the same. Okay, we want to take your questions now. I have three requests. When I call on you, please wait for our microphone to get to you so everybody can hear your question. Please identify yourself and any affiliation that you might have, and please keep your questions brief so that we can get to as many people as possible. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Richard Dashbach. I am, have been puzzled from day one, why in the world did the Bush Department of Justice indict Ted Stevens. I don't mean to be such a cynic, but how in the world did that happen? Ask, ask me? All right. So uh, the president doesn't indict anybody. 
the prosecutors do, and um, uh, the political uh, forces in an administration should not be weighing in on the merits of a prosecution. Uh, the prosecutors in this case, um, I guess, I wasn't there, but I guess they believed that there was cause to investigate and, and proceed. As we know now, uh, they proceeded in a deeply flawed way and withheld evidence that would have uh, been very helpful to Senator Stevens in his defense. He should not have been indicted. He should not have been convicted. As Judge Kaczynski said, he should not have lost his Senate seat. Um, but the Bush administration didn't indict. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alaska, I guess, and ultimately the Public Integrity Section uh, were responsible for bringing the indictment. You know, I, I think the fact that Senator Stevens was indicted speaks well for our system. A Republican Justice Party, uh, 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 an administration led by a Republican president indicts a very powerful Republican senator. So in principle, it speaks well that, that in fact, politics do not and should not play a, a role in bringing uh, a prosecution. This is why, to me, it didn't matter who the attorney general was. Uh, 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 it, it is. It is. The, it is. There was holding of evidence. That's. 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 Um, that's the fault. And I don't believe that was political. I don't think that they were withholding evidence because they wanted to get a Republican senator. I think they just were holding evidence because they wanted to win the case. They wanted to get back their their scalp. Yes, sir. John Quinstadter, Red Zima Photo. Ma'am, thank you very much for what you've done. A very simple question. Um, what you've described uh, could describe any common or garden variety activity behind the Iron Curtain. And there were good reasons why people didn't speak up there. Uh, but I'd like to know if we have a change in administration in, in 2016, I repeat if, and if we get uh, an administration in which does truly want to clean up, how is it going to get rid of civil servants who are well entrenched in the Justice Department? And how is it going to ensure that judges, some of whom uh, may in fact uh, make their decisions based on political criteria, uh, that they follow the law? Thank you. They can't do anything in particular about the judges other than making sure that in their new political appointments, they impress upon the judges the importance of following the Brady rule, question them about their view of Brady and things like that. Um, but in terms of uh, a new attorney general making changes, the Project on Government Oversight, pogo.org, has released a report based on its Freedom of Information Act request identifying over 450 instances of intentional or reckless prosecutorial misconduct over the last decade. Attorney General Holder refuses to release even the names of those prosecutors. The Stevens prosecutors, uh, the two that were found guilty by the special prosecutor by his investigation of intentional misconduct are still in the department as assistant United States attorneys. One of them served one day of a suspension according to the POGO report. Otherwise, they appealed their, uh, the rulings. Of course, the internal review process of the department watered down the findings in its own report and um, I, f I forgot what level it found them responsible at, but one was assessed a 40-day suspension, one was assessed a 14-day suspension, and one of them served one day of the suspension. Otherwise, it's been appealed and since lost in the quagmire at the Justice Department. Um, I think a new attorney general could make very clear, uh, first of all, regardless of civil service, if I were the attorney general, I'd fire them all tomorrow and let the civil section litigate the propriety of the firings, if necessary. I just think it's completely unacceptable for anyone who has the responsibility and the privilege of walking into a courtroom of the United States of America and standing in front of a federal judge and saying, I represent the United States of America. It is completely unacceptable for them to lie to a court, lie to a jury, or withhold evidence from the defense. And they'd be gone in five minutes. Another one of these tactics that's kind of shocking um, 
And Judge Kaczynski touched on this in, in his foreword to the book is, uh, you know, the way in which a trial is supposed to happen is the prosecutor calls his witnesses that they think supports their case and the defense gets to call their witnesses to establish their side of the story. And when prosecutors get wind of who the defense witnesses are going to be, then they kind of quietly but approach these witnesses and pressure them and threaten them with prosecution if they agree to testify for somebody who's heading for trial. This is just shocking to me. And yet, uh, we learned from your book that this is more common than many people realize. Uh, did it happen in the two cases that you write about in detail in the book? And, and what can you tell us more about that tactic and how common it is? It definitely happened daily in the all the Enron-related prosecutions. All the defense lawyers were screaming about it. Jeff McMahon, for example, who's, the notes of whose interviews we finally got accidentally with all the yellow highlighted exculpatory information, he was threatened multiple times a day with being indicted for his role in the Merrill Lynch Enron transaction on which the uh, entire alleged criminal activity depended. Turns out he was, that was during the trial and those calls, you know, intensified during our trial to keep him off the witness stand. He was never indicted. So my client served a year in prison for a transaction that McMahon said was perfectly lawful, that Andrew Fastow had said per was perfectly lawful, and for which McMahon was never indicted of making the guarantee that my client served a year in prison for having done. And we know, we knew when we got the yellow highlighted notes why, because they would have had to have produced that if they had indicted McMahon, just like if they had, uh, you know, had a, called fast out to testify in our trial, we might have gotten the notes then uh, as to what he'd said. So they didn't have fast or McMahon or any participant in the transaction testify in our trial. They only used hearsay evidence of the subordinates who fast out had to, said he had actually lied to. But yeah, that tactic is very common, way too common. Yes, ma'am. My name is Janice Walt Grenadier. I was um, given a 30-day sentence to jail yesterday um, in the city of Alexandria court. It was suspended um, for fighting for my right of due process and a judge with jurisdiction. Um, Americans are unaware of how corrupt our system is and that the judges, the Virginia State, the, the different um, boards are all patting each other on the back and basically um, taking care of their criminal actions. Um, the judicial system polices themselves. There is nowhere to go. I have gone everywhere. I asked for a trial by jury and was denied it. Um, I asked to go in front of a grand jury to ask for a special grand jury. I was ordered by the Supreme Court Justice Cynthia Kinzer to be allowed to go in front of the grand jury. Instead, myself and my witnesses were kidnapped into another courtroom and denied access to the grand jury. Um, my evidence with three different judges has been taken out of my file and mailed back to me. I have a box that is unopened of my evidence. Okay, you have to have a question for our panel. I have a question as to what can we really do to get the government to, or somebody that is not, arm, that is arm's length to look into cases like this? Where do you go? Well, that's basically the sum of why I had to write the book. You know, there, there are solutions. Uh, North Carolina had a solution with a rogue prosecutor. You all remember the lacrosse case. And what... Uh, the Duke lacrosse case? Yes. The Duke lacrosse case, uh, a rogue prosecutor uh, who eventually was disbarred and perhaps yes. convicted. Uh, but they went further. North Carolina went further and they passed a statute f uh, that uh, provides for open discovery. Basically, if the prosecutor has it in the file, he has to turn the file over to the defense. And that seems eminently fair. This is not trial by ambush. We are not uh, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. We're in a um, system of due process. And it seems to me the defendant is entitled to know what's in the prosecutor's file. 
there's usually plenty there to convict, and most defendants at that point say, well, never mind, I'll cop a plea because they got me. Uh, but a lot of times there's stuff in there that the prosecutor may not understand to be exculpatory because the prosecutor's job is not to figure out what's good for the defense, but defense lawyers are paid to do that. So it's very simple. We have a piece of legislation introduced by Ninth Circuit Senator Murkowski, uh, co-sponsored by another Ninth Circuit Senator. Uh, it had six bipartisan sponsors. Uh, so I'm very proud of our circuit for, uh, 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 but, but of course, uh, Senator Murkowski, because it was Senator Stevens from Alaska, who suffered. So she introduced uh, the, the Fairness and Disclosure of Evidence Act, and then uh, Sidney mentioned the Prosecutorial Integrity Act. You pass laws, and then prosecutors live, live by them. And if you shine a light on what is hidden there in the prosecutor's files, uh, then you will have a much better chance of having You don't count on people being honest or count on people being fair. Uh, it's just there. So that's what I would suggest. I would suggest we have legislation pending. It should be supported. It should be passed. Okay, I think I see Ellen Gurra in the back. Uh, thank you. Alan Gura. Um, to what extent does the criminal defense bar put pressure on state bar authorities to take this uh, more seriously with their, uh, with their powers of discipline? And to the extent that the state bar authorities may not be very responsive, what is the role of the federal district court disciplinary committees to actually uh, discipline attorneys who appear before them? I know that Judge Kaczynski, for example, a long time ago in the Yagman versus Central District case dealt with a case where uh, attorneys were criticizing judges, and those you know attorneys in that circumstance obviously get a lot of attention from the from the district court disciplinary committees. But uh, if the state bar authorities are are not much help, what about the judges themselves and their disciplinary powers? I think that's a great point, and I actually drafted a Brady compliance order that I'm going to upload to the website too. That includes that as one of the steps the federal district judges can take. Uh, we tend to forget about that, but federal judges can decide that a lawyer's not fit to practice in their district or in their courtroom, and they have a lot of authority to start making waves in that regard. I don't know that the criminal defense bar is putting any pressure on the bar associations at all. I have, I have no information on that, really. It took the Texas Court of Inquiry in the Michael Morton case that you all may have heard about. It received a lot of news and is now the subject of a book he's written. A man spent 25 years in prison accused of the murder of his wife while the prosecutor became a, who hid the bloody bandana evidence literally um, became a state court judge having run his campaign on his conviction of Michael Morton. Of course, the DNA on the bandana completely exonerated Michael Morton, thanks to the work of the Innocence Project over a number of years. The Texas Bar convened a special court of inquiry that took an act of God and Congress, basically, to get that done. Uh, it resulted in the state court judge being arrested in open court, but he only served 10 days I think, you know, if we made the penalty, uh, if you deliberately withhold evidence, you serve the length of time in prison that your uh, victim wrongfully spent, that might kind of nip it in the bud. But yes. I think what happens is um, judges have a certain expectation of what the lawyers before them will do. And it's particularly true of prosecutors. You expect lawyers to always tell the truth you expect lawyers to always be entirely full square, uh, particularly if you're, if you're a government prosecutor. And I think most judges uh, have a hard time believing that the chicanery actually going on. And so they tend to be less uh, likely to look for it or to, to infer that something is misconduct. Uh, I had a case about uh, 20 years ago um, where the prosecutor made certain statements at district court. We then, same guy uh, foolishly argued an appeal, so I asked him about it. And after hemming and hawing, he disclosed something that he had not told the district judge. He, he didn't want to do it, but I was pretty insistent. Uh, and it turned out to be quite key. And we sent the case back. We did, vacated the conviction. The case Kojayan, you know, it's Kojayan. You ought to read this. Good, good opinion. It's well written. Uh, but we sent it back to the district judge. 
to make a decision whether to indict with pre, uh, to dismiss indictment with prejudice or without prejudice. The district judge, a very fine, uh, I should say, Republican appointee, although it truly doesn't matter. I mean, it, it truly doesn't matter. Um, uh, a very experienced judge, had been a state court judge, had been a, a district judge for many years. The case came back, and he could not believe the answer that I got out of the prosecutor. He had been so convinced that that couldn't possibly be the answer that he didn't even ask the question. He didn't press the question. Even though the defense lawyer said, ask him this question, make sure that... So what happened, the, the judge was so shocked by it, he dismissed the indictment with prejudice, um, which means the prosecution was dead um, altogether. I think most judges just can't believe this is going on. Uh, and uh, my two colleagues in the Ramirez Lopez case, I don't think they believe quite what was going on until they were pressed to do it. Okay, thank you for that comment. I'm afraid we have run out of time, but everybody here is invited to the luncheon we'll be having afterwards. Please thank our panel for a good discussion. Thank you.